So welcome everybody, welcome back to GADMAC 23, Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Emergency EVAC New Zealand and our platinum, platinum sponsor for Paws International. Our next session is called Dogs of Chernobyl, Beyond the Russian Invasion, the Impact of the Russian Occupation of the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Plant, and that what that's and that's sorry, that's had on the Dogs of Chernobyl program. Apologies. Uh, and the presenter for this uh, session is Jennifer Betts. Um, Jennifer is the uh, Veterinary Medical Director, Clean, Clean Futures Fund, Dogs of Chernobyl from the USA. So it's a privilege to have you with us, Jennifer. Thank you so much for your time. Um, just some basic housekeeping before we start for those who didn't join us for the first session. Uh, the Zoom chat feature has been um, disabled. So if you've got any questions, please ask those in the Q&A and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. So we have 20 minute presentation and then hopefully five minutes for questions at the end. Um, there are multiple uh, languages available if you use the closed caption feature, um, which is at the bottom of your screen. So if you need help with translation, please use that. Um, we encourage you to use the hashtag GADMACConf for Twitter and other social media. And a re videos recordings will be made of these presentations, which will be available later to you. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jen for her, for her presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. So hello everyone. <clears throat> Again, my name is Dr. Jennifer Betts and I'm the Veterinary Medical Director for the Dogs of Chernobyl program under the Clean Futures Fund. Uh, my presentation today is about our program and how the Russian occupation of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant affected the dogs of Chernobyl. This presentation has been shortened from one hour for time restraints uh, constraints. Uh, so if you're interested in the full presentation, it can be seen on our, our YouTube channel. In 1986, the Unit 4 reactor of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded and re released radioactive materials into the environment. The Soviet government forced 120,000 residents from the surrounding towns to evacuate. They were told they would be gone for three days and were forced to leave their pets behind with food and water. They were never allowed to return. The government tried to, uh, tried to kill all the pets in the area in hopes to stem the spread of radiation, but some survived. And since then, the stray dogs and cats have been living in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. The workers at the power plant try to care for these animals as best as they can on their own. However, in 19, excuse me, in 2016, after a visit to the power plant and noticing all of the stray dogs around the exclusion zone, the Clean Futures Fund was formed to start planning a massive spay and neuter and vaccination program to help care for these dogs. And this is how the Dogs of Chernobyl program began. For this presentation, this specific area of the power plant right here uh, is what I'll be talking about. This is the new safe confinement structure. This was built over the old sarcophagus that uh, covers the destroyed reactor number four. The, react the sarcophagus that constructed over reactor four was only uh, a temporary fix to stem the, stem the spread of radiation and was only to last around 30 years. So they had to construct this new safe confinement structure to cover the old sarcophagus, and this is supposed to last around 100 years. During the construction of the new safe confinement, there were a lot of dogs living around and underneath it while they were building it and have remained in this area as well as other areas around the zone. So today I will be talking about this certain pack of dogs that live right in this area here called uh, the local zone or the arch. <clears throat> so in 2017, the Dogs of Chernobyl program set up their first spay and neuter clinic in the Chernobyl exclusion zone to help control the population of dogs that were getting out of control. Between 2017 and 19, we successfully spayed, neutered, and vaccinated over 750 dogs that reside in the zone. <clears throat> Unfortunately, because of COVID, we were unable to perform any clinics in 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> in early of 2022, the nuclear power plant contacted us and said, you have to do something about the dogs living at the arch. They are reproducing at a rapid rate. There's hundreds of them around here, and something needs to be done very soon. So we said, uh, okay, we think COVID has relaxed enough now. And so we started making plans to perform another spay neuter clinic, specifically at the new safe confinement where a lot of these dogs in the past were very difficult to catch. 
we started making plans for having a new upcoming project to happen in May of 2022. But then the unthinkable happened. On February 24, 2022, I woke early in the morning with numerous text messages and calls on my phone. Russian forces had invaded Ukraine and captured the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. We had no contact with anyone for over a month as they had 150 hostages held captive in a bunker at the power plant. Since many of the dogs rely on the workers at the power plant to feed them, they were not fed for 30 days. I was told that a couple of workers were able to sneak out and feed uh, some scraps to the dogs, but essentially they were not fed at all for 30 days. Some of the dogs ran off either in search for food or because of the loud commotion that was going on with the tanks and such, but unfortunately, a lot of them just stayed around waiting and waiting to be fed. So this video here, this is the Lelev checkpoint, which is between Chernobyl town and Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Um, this is after they have captured the power plant and they're trying to make their way to Kyiv. This video was found, it wasn't confiscated, it was found after the liberation of the power plant. And I just, I put this on here because I wanted to, sh you know, show this is that long convoy that was going to uh, Kyiv to try to, to capture uh, Kyiv. And then, uh, you know, the, the missiles and stuff that they brought in, they were, they were definitely planning on doing some damage. But the reason I put this video in here is because I was going through this and I, uh, I noticed um, this, you see this white object right here that's coming out of the woods and running alongside the tank. Um, she'll be crossing the street here in a minute. <clears throat> uh, right here, so this white dog that's running across the street. So this dog has uh, been a resident, has lived at the uh, Lelov checkpoint at the guardhouse and the guards took care of her. She's lived there for several years. And uh, I happened to notice that this is the last time that we ever saw this dog. I don't know what happened to her, but uh, she's never been seen again, which is pretty unfortunate. So on April 1st, 2022, Russian forces retreated and Ukrainians gained control of the power plant again. We were finally able to make contact with people in Chernobyl and were able to get some information from the power plant. Of course, my first questions were, what about the dogs? How are they? These are the first photos that I received of the dogs. They were able to do some snapshots of them and send it to me. And as you can see, they were skin and bones and they were basically starving to death. Here's some more photos of them just scrounging for anything they can find. After seeing the conditions of the dogs from the photos, I thought I have to get food to them somehow. And as it just so happened, uh, Andrew Simon, who is a who works for my partner, Dr. Musso at the Chernobyl Research Initiative, was going to try to get to Chernobyl and check on the laboratory that we have there. We had a lot of equipment at the lab and we were told the door was kicked in and a lot of the stuff was stolen. So when Andrew told me he was going to try to make it to the lab to check on things, I asked him, could you please, please take some dog food? So at this point, our liaison, Andrew, was one of very, very few people who were allowed to enter the exclusion zone. And since Andrew was going to be able to make the long trip I scrounged around and found out where I could purchase dog food and had Andrew pick it up in Kiev. I purchased 300 kilograms, which is 660 pounds of dog food to start. And this is the first bags of food. It took Andrew nine hours to reach Chernobyl. Normally it takes one and a half hours, but because of the blown up bridges and the ruined roads by the tanks, it took him nine hours to reach Chernobyl. He was not allowed to drive to the power plant, he could only drop off the food at the guardhouse at the Ditkiatki checkpoint, but he was able to get to our lab at, in Chernobyl town and find, uh, and in fact, it was broken into and a lot of stuff stolen. So <clears throat> at this point, they were busing in new workers to relieve other workers that were there. And uh, I contacted every single worker that I knew, and I begged them all to tell their friends to please grab a bag of dog food that was waiting at the guardhouse and take it with them on the bus to the power plant. Even some people who didn't even like dogs grabbed a bag of dog food. It was uh, really amazing. Everybody knew the conditions that the dogs were in and they wanted to help regardless of whether they liked dogs or not. So each person grabbed a bag of dog food and put it in the bus with them to, to work. And these are the dogs getting their first significant amount of food since the invasion after 30 days. And as you can see, it was a feeding frenzy. 
we continued to bring dog food in as much as we could, working with the buses that took the workers to the power plant. Also, Andrew was able to get around Chernobyl town to be able to feed some of the dogs around the town. And after discussing with him, uh, we decided that he could easily make some automatic dog feeder feeders to put around the zone for the dogs in Chernobyl town. Um, these are some of the pictures of the dog uh, feeders that we made, and it worked really, really well. So we decided to make a bunch more and put them all around the exclusion zone. So the dogs, because we couldn't get in there very often. So this way they had a ability to eat. Since that day, we have been delivering 800 kilograms or 1,760 pounds of food per week to the dogs in the zone. After everything that happened, all I can think about was the condition of the dogs and our friends. I needed to get to the dog, get there to check on the status and the health status of these dogs. Uh, so Eric, the founder of Clean Futures Fund, and I decided we were going to make the trip to Chernobyl despite some objections from our family members. June 2022, we decided to make the trip. You cannot fly into Ukraine, so you have to fly to Poland and take an 18-hour train ride from Bruce to Kiev. When we arrived at the train station, we, we met up with our two Ukrainian ladies, Andrew and, and, and Vadim. Vadim, Eric, Andrew, and I made the long journey uh, to Chernobyl, passing up several blown up bridges, passing a lot of destruction. This is a, a, a pontoon bridge that we had to cross. And once we arrived in Chernobyl, we went around to all of the office to deliver aid. Uh, all of the offices were broken into. They stole everything. They stole every hard drive and RAM from every single computer throughout the Chernobyl exclusion zone. <clears throat> One of our biggest fears were landmines, and they were everywhere. But by this time, the majority of them had been cleared and deemed safe along the roadways. Uh, this is a Chernobyl fire truck that actually did pass over a landmine. Thankfully, nobody was killed, but they were severely uh, injured and uh, a Chernobyl dog right here. Um, this is also what we came in contact with was uh, a lot of uh, destruction uh, throughout the whole place. This is the town of Chernihiv. We made it to the highly secure area of the power plant just at the base of the arch or new safe confinement. There are a lot of dogs and new puppies everywhere. So in the past, we had been unsuccessful in 2017, 18, and 19 in catching the dogs that live in this area. And the reason is, is that this is an industrial area and there are a lot of fences and obstacles for the dogs to run through and go out of, out of reach. And uh, in the past, you know, it was a construction zone. So we would only have one day to be in this restricted area. And when we would go in there and blow dart one dog, all the other dogs would take off running and run through the fences and go in, into areas that we couldn't access. Uh, and then our time would be up because um, you have only have a limited amount of time to be in this area. So over the years, we were only able to get maybe two or three dogs from this area at a time. And since we were unable to get many dogs in this area, the breeding got out of control and became unmanageable. Since we had been feeding them and fattening them up, <clears throat> then we were they were healthy, healthy enough to do what they do best, which is breed and have puppies. We saw probably 10 or 11 pregnant dogs just in this area alone. And here I am feeling one of her little pregnant bellies. Since we knew blow darting was not going to work here since it did not work in the past, we started looking for areas that we can section off and make corrals to contain the dogs. And we found some great places. So this is us checking and finding some places that we can rig up to, to catch these dogs. After seeing all the pregnant dogs at the arch, Eric and I decided we needed to get back here soon. So we started making plans right then and there to return a couple months later in early October. I knew we needed to train these dogs to get them used to entering in these makeshift corrals to make catching them easier, but we were not gonna be around to do this as we live in the United States. I had noticed on a Viber chat group that I was in with some of the workers and this one gentleman named Yuri was very knowledgeable of the dogs and had a great concern for them. So I struck up a conversation with him. He only spoke Ukrainian and I do not. And keep in mind the time difference and the translations that needed to take place, the copying and the pasting and the 
translating back and forth. I found myself conversing with Yuri at about 3 a.m. my time every time. And uh, I wasn't sleeping much anyway, so it, it really didn't matter. He was very receptive to my ideas on how to train the dogs, and he got to work right away. He would send me pictures at three in the morning saying, I got them to go in the fenced area. I got them to go in the fenced area. I was like, great, perfect. Now let's practice closing the gate. <laughs> so then he would send me more pictures. I got the gate closed. I got the gate closed. Uh, he was really excited. It was great working with him. And I developed a friendship with a guy over Viber chat who I had no idea what he even looked like. And I knew that he was vital to the success of us catching these dogs. And I knew that he, we needed his help as he knew every single one of them. He even had names for all of them. He also helped deliver many of the puppies that were being born over the years. These were basically his dogs and he loved them. So I asked if he could make his work schedule so that it coincided with when we were going to have our trip in October. And he was thrilled. He made his, he made a schedule change and everything was all set up and he was going to help us catch the dogs. But then two weeks before the campaign, we have two major changes. Yuri tells me he was laid off at the plant. They were doing massive layoffs and after 32 years of work, he no longer had access to the power plant. We had to do an emergency request to get permissions for him to enter the zone with us as a CFF volunteer. And the other thing, Vadim informed me that he will not be able to help us in October as he had just signed up for the Ukrainian military to fight for his country. Vadim had done a lot of preparation and organization for our upcoming trip. And it was a shame he was not gonna be able to be there to work with us again this year as he had done every single year in the past, volunteering his time. So October 22 rolls around and we uh, rounded up a small group of veterinarians, veterinary technicians and dog handlers that had volunteered with us in the past and were somewhat comfortable with going into a war-torn country. We hit the long 18 hour train ride from Poland to Kyiv again and met up with some other volunteers from Germany uh, and, and Ukraine in Kyiv and then headed off to Chernobyl. So this is our entire team. We had members from Ukraine, Germany, UK and the United States and half of us spoke English and the other half did not. So this is at the power plant and the dogs live in packs. They, they, they stay to themselves and they live in packs. Of course, there's a lot more dogs than this, but this is one pack that lives up at the front or the base of the arch. And this right here is one of the corrals that we sectioned off here. Um, so this is one pack of dogs. And then uh, you can see that the arch is further in the back. And this is another pack of dogs that live in this area. So we would get the dogs to come into this corralled area. Yuri would grab food and they would come following him because they were used to him feeding them. And they'd get in here. And most of them we were able to either catch by hand or get close enough to be able to give an injection. Um, these particular dogs here were extremely fearful. They, they weren't uh, aggressive. They were just very, very fearful. So instead of stressing them out or trying to run around and chase them, I gave them meatballs with gabapentin trazodone and acepromazine mixed together. And we waited about one to two hours after they ate it. That's how long it took for them to get sleepy enough for us to be able to get close enough to them to be able to, to give them an injection. Um, so we, we ended up, we did not have to blow dart any dogs at all. And this, uh, we're, we were able to give a total fear-free approach. Once the dogs are caught, uh, the first thing you can do before doing anything else is they need to be frisked for radiation. We need to make sure they're clean of any radioactive contaminants before they can go into surgery to help keep us safe. And if we do find anything that has significant radioactive contaminants on them, we take them outside, we give them a bath, and we clip their fur that has particles on it. So you can remove these particles by washing or clipping but we did find um, some puppies that uh, we were not able to do this to. Okay. We recently brought two little siblings into the clinic. After we frisked them for radiation, we found a hot spot on the top of both of their heads. 
about 14 or 1500 counts per minute. We'd like it to be under 200. So we gave him a bath. Um, we gave the brother a bath, and despite that, both of them still have contamination right on the top of their head. So we determined that it's probably non-removable. It's maybe fixed contamination inside the bone structure, likely strontium-90 that's it's treated like calcium by the body. So if you can see, top of this poor girl's head is over 1,000 counts per minute. Okay, that's 1,200. And I'm going to demonstrate that this is non-removable. I'm going to really put my fingers. So if there was something on the top of, of her head, it's going to be on my glove right now, okay? So let's check my glove. So. Yeah, you do your glove again. Okay, and so this is a picture of our surgery room that we set up to show that even though we're basically in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, we can still perform quality surgery and use the best techniques. All the dogs are on IV fluids, they're on gas anesthesia, and they're intubated. Um, we do have to make some compromises using like ironing boards as surgery tables and uh, empty beer bottles or water bottles for uh, thoracic positioners, but we, we made do with what we could and we tried to provide the best medicine that we possibly could. So during prep, all dogs are intubated. Their a plat catheter is placed in their legs so that they can receive fluids during the procedure. They're then shaved and prepped. Um, they're given an ear tattoo and they're given a microchip and then they are taken into surgery. And you'll notice some of the pink and blue markings on their, their noses. Uh, in the past, we would put ear tags in their ears but um, once in a while, you'd have some that would get infected and become troublesome. And uh, since these dogs were in an area that was extremely difficult to catch them again, if something should happen and their ear tags became infected, they'd have to wander around with infected ears. And I, I just couldn't do that. So I um, decided to just ear tattoo them and tattoo their bellies and, uh, and, and then mark their, their noses so that we knew that the next day that that dog had been done and we didn't catch that dog again. And this, this came off in about five weeks. So it just, it's just temporary paint and it washes, washes off. Um, so these come off after that. So this is the kind of conditions we had to, to, to get these dogs from. These pups were hidden under a cement structure and we had to send our smallest person we could to crawl underneath them and retrieve them. And since you're not supposed to crawl on the ground, you're not supposed to put anything on the ground. You're not really supposed to get any of these particles on you. Um, we had to make sure that she was free of any radioactive contaminants uh, before she could continue. Uh, one of the highlights uh, was every evening we would go outside and feed the dogs. Um, you would walk out there with some food, there'd be no dogs anywhere, and then next thing you know there's a hundred dogs coming out from every different area. Um, so we're already working on a research project, and this is my partner Dr. Mousseau. And he's been research, uh, doing research studying the dog's DNA for genetic mutations, and also recently determined that the dogs that live in the area are in fact, the true descendants of the dogs that were left behind in 1986. So we know this through DNA, DNA sequencing. And this paves the way for much more information that we can gather in the future, and also help us determine how the radiation has affected the dogs. And so the dog is a great model for humans. So the information we gather here can be extrapolated to humans. We've recently had three published that have been, uh, three, three papers that have been recently published on this topic with just in the last few months. All right, and here's a, this dog right here was uh, extremely difficult to catch, um, but I really wanted to, to catch her. And, um, and then this is her in this video here. So this is a dog, this is our first year 2017. We were at the local zone of the plant and we were able to catch this dog. It's already been sterilized. Um, as you can see right here, we have the tattoo from 2017. And this particular ear tag is from 2017. Um, every year we've caught the dogs. We've caught the dogs every year at, to revaccinate them, but sometimes we can't catch them. Uh, a lot of times we would remove a couple months later, get the dosimeter that's on here to check how much radiation they get. 
Um, but we were, haven't seen this dog and or been able to catch it in several years since 2017. So we were able to catch him today. We're going to revaccinate. She's already been sterilized. We're going to remove this dosimeter so that Dr. Mousseau, um, so that Dr. Mousseau can then in his laboratory be able to see how much radiation this dog has had since 2017. Um, so this, uh, this is a kind of a rare find. Most of the tags have been uh, either removed or came out, or we've done them for uh, the, the study that we're doing. She is um, so she's, You can see she's way. doing really well. Uh, she looks like she's you know, probably about uh, five or six years old. So she was well, a puppy when we did her, and this is, uh, this is really good to show that they're doing fine, and we're seeing that they're living a lot longer because of the sterilization program that we're doing and uh, everything else the pro with this program. So we, we, we finalized, we finished our, our project in October and the, and the final numbers, I could not be more pleased. I was so happy. <clears throat> we spayed 75 females. We had 125 dogs and 75 of them were females. And think about it, only females actually have pups, right? So if each dog has approximately six puppies per litter, which is the average litter size in Chernobyl dogs, that's 450 dogs that we prevented from being born in just this next year. And then uh, when the campaign was over and we finally make it back to Kiev, and this is all of us at a group dinner, uh, getting some real food uh, just before we get back on the train to go back to Poland. And then once we were on the train to Poland, we see on the news that 400 meters from this restaurant was bombed 12 hours after we left. So just 400 meters away. So the reality hit hard for me realizing how every single day these people are experiencing this nonstop and it's just horrible. And speaking of reality, on January 28, 2023, I was woke at three in the morning with the devastating phone call that Vadim had been killed on the battle at Bakhmut. His entire unit was hit by a grad rocket and killed six and critically wounded four. And we all miss him very dearly. He's been a longtime volunteer of ours and a very dear friend. Um, and then here's uh, here's our published papers here. These are the, the three that have just recently come out. Um, if you want information on this, if you pretty much just uh, search uh, Google, Google search Chernobyl dogs, you can find a lot of these papers. Um, some of them have been featured in the New York Times just recently. And then um, as far as our organization, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, like I said, if you want to see this extended uh, pro uh, presentation that's an hour long, it has way more and more information involved, um, you can find it on our YouTube channel. And then if anybody um, has any specific questions that they don't get to ask here or later or watch this later, uh, I could always be reached at drbetts at cleanfutures.org and I'd be happy to uh, answer any of your questions. And um, that uh, that wrap, wraps it up. Thank you, Jennifer. Could you um, just stop sharing your screen? That'd be fabulous. Um, and I'm so uh, jealous of everybody in the attendees because I'm here with tears in my eyes thinking, how am I going to regain my composure before we have the uh, question and answer session? Um, look, just an amazing presentation. Um, so interesting to hear about the complexities uh, that you're having to deal with. Um, obviously, you know, the war is one thing, but the nuclear uh, radiation remains as well on top of all of that, just uh, adding to it. And, um, you know, I think we will take our hats off to your, uh, you and your team for the dedication. Um, I, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I, I couldn't bear to kind of stop you uh, midway there. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, if you put them in the question answer session, we'll certainly try and get to one or two if we can before um, in the next four or five minutes. In the meantime, um, yeah, my background is psychology. So I'm here listening to you speaking and I'm wondering how you and your team are managing the, you know, the, the psychological um, impacts of that attachment you have with the animals and the work and taking care of each other. Have you got any sort of um, thoughts about how you're managing with that? You know, we we were a close knit group. We we talk a lot. Um, one of the good things is that you know, even though I'm back in the United States, I have constant communication with the workers, um, other people that are in the area. Andrew, who you know goes into the zone twice a week delivering food for us, and so I get constant constant feedback. Um, and then all of our our friends as well. Um, you know, it's it's really difficult times right now, and um, it's just mm. it's it's hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, I imagine it's hard to leave that behind, even uh, wherever you go, actually. Um, 
And uh, I'm, I'm just um, pleased to say that we have seen uh, that research in the media in Australia here um, that your, your work, your, um, you and your colleagues have done. So that's really exciting. Good. Okay. Thank you very much again, Jennifer. We really appreciate your presentation, all the time you've taken. I can't wait to look at the rest of that sort of longer presentation and uh, wish you and your team all the best. Uh, and of course, the dogs too. Um, we hope everything calms down very quickly and yeah, some you're getting better access. So thank you again, everybody.